Today we're going to talk about two, uh, two very, very, very relevant things today. One is the nation of Israel, and the other is oil. And we know from Scripture that 4,000 years ago, when God brought Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees, he promised him two things. He promised him seed that would be numbered as the stars of the sky and as the sand of this, uh, the seashore. And he promised him a land for an everlasting possession. That was 4,000 years ago. And I don't think anyone on earth could have ever imagined what the world would look like today. I don't think anyone on earth could ever imagine that something like oil, something like a, a, a resource that was um, almost unrecognized in ancient times would play such an important role in everything that happens today. Uh, the world, in 2007, the world used more than 85 million barrels of oil a day, and it's only gone up since then. Um, it controls the economy of every country in the world. It controls the geopolitical status of every country in the world. 57% of the world's oil reserves are in Gulf nations are in nations that are unfriendly to the nation of Israel. If you add in Russia and the, and the former Russian states, and you add in North Africa, which is all Islamic, you come up with about 69% of the world's oil reserves. And it's odd that the joke is that Moses should have turned left instead of right to enter the Holy Land because it seems like the only spot in the entire Middle East with no oil is Israel. And the question has to be, God is the Alpha and Omega. He says he's the Alpha and Omega. He no says he knows the beginning from the end. 4,000 years ago, did God take this into account? 4,000 years ago, could God, when he promised Abraham that land as an everlasting possession, possibly foresee what the world would be like today? And of course, I believe the answer is yes. There's another question. Is it even in God's nature to, to consider something like oil as a resource for Israel? Is, it, is God above that kind of thing? Is, is God more spiritual than that? Or is it even in God's nature to even consider something like that, blessing a country with oil? First, uh, I want you to go to Isaiah 45.3. Really, really interesting passage. Here Isaiah is prophesying. Isaiah 45.3 says, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. Doesn't that sound like it could be a prophecy about Israel, about oil rather, about oil? The hidden riches of secret places and the treasures of darkness. This prophecy wasn't about Israel. This prophecy wasn't for Israel. This prophecy was for Cyrus. Remember, Cyrus was the king of Persia. He founded Persia. Cyrus allowed the Israelites to go and rebuild their nation, to go and rebuild Jerusalem. Cyrus, the founder of Persia, gets this promise from God. I will give thee treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. Persia was the first country in the Middle East where the first oil well was drilled in the Middle East in 1908. And so, and so we really think, yeah, it, 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 God, it is in God's nature to do this. And the fact that he would promise Cyrus this and it would come to, it would come to fruition, that promise would come to fruition today in, in modern times is a proof that, that, yeah, God would consider something like oil. God's, God's big enough that he considers things that we might think of as small. So now we say for Israel, if Israel's in the position she's in now, if she's the only 
nation in the Middle East that doesn't have any oil. If her, or if her enemies are surrounding her, are rich with oil, would God consider something like that from Israel? And what we have to do is we have to go to the Bible and look. And, and nowhere in the Bible does it say, and I promised the petroleum in the year 2010. So we have to look for other clues. And the, and the place we want to start looking is in Genesis, in the beginning. Genesis 49, we'll start with 49.1. Another thing we want to look for, too, and that two questions that we've got is, 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 is there any place in the Bible that would hint that God would, would provide oil for Israel in the last days? And two, if there's a place in the Bible, if there's anything in the Bible that hints to that, does it tell us where to look? And those are the two questions that we're going to try to answer today. God promised Abraham the land as an everlasting possession. Again, when, when Abraham's son Isaac came along, God promised Isaac the land as an everlasting possession. When Jacob, Abraham's grandson, came along, God promised Jacob the land as an everlasting possession. Now, you remember the story of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. There was a famine in the land. Before the famine, Joseph got sold into Egypt. Um, through God's miraculous working, Joseph becomes the prime minister of Egypt, um, and he saves his family by bringing them down into Egypt. Jacob now is in Egypt, and he's on his deathbed. And in 49.1, the Bible says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Jacob doesn't say, I'm about to die. I want to I I give you my last will and testament. Um, you get my robe, you get the camels. You, he didn't say that. He said, I want to tell you what's going to befall you in the last days. And then he proceeds to bless his sons. And he blesses all of his sons. Because of certain things the sons did in their lives, some of the blessings weren't blessings. They were more like cursings. But for our, for our study here, we're going we're gonna to focus on certain blessings and see if they can tell us anything at all about the possibility of oil in Israel. In uh, Genesis 49, 20, uh, he blesses Asher. And, it's, and to, to pull something like oil out of this blessing in 49, 20 is pretty tough. Uh, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. So it almost sounds like Asher's going to be a baker and, and have nothing to do with oil. It's the, the only interesting thing in that passage at all is that word fat is the Hebrew word shemen. And the Hebrew word shemen is a, a universal word for anything that is fatty, liquid fatty, oil. Uh, in the term, they used really, really common in the Old Testament. They used the word shemen for olive oil, any kind of animal fat, any kind of oil. But still, it's to, to try to, to pin that passage on an oil promise of Israel in the last days is just too far fetched. But we go down just just two verses down, and he begins his blessing to Joseph. And he says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. Well, at least we've got a well here. Now, to, to, to pin that on an oil well is, is still too far-fetched. But the idea that Joseph is going to be fruitful, that he's going to be a fruitful bough by a well, and that, his, that his, whatever his blessing is, is going to be so profound that it's going to run over the wall. He's going to be able to share it with others. That's the very, very first hint, vague, vague hint, but the very first hint we have. But then Jacob goes down and continues to bless Joseph. And in, in, in verse 25, uh, Jacob uh, continues the blessing. In verse 25, he says, Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heavens above, and the blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. The first thing we see here in, in verse 25 is the blessings of the deep that lieth under. What could possibly, you think this is, this is now 3,700 years ago. What could possibly be the blessings of the deep that lieth under? Could it be water? Could it be? It, it had to be something deep. It had to be, and, and in the Hebrew, this means very, very deep. But it, it's another hint 
It's not enough for us to say that this could possibly be oil. But we have something here that's cryptic that says, the blessings of the deep that lieth under. And then in the next verse, Jacob goes on and says, the blessings of the, thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of, him that, of, of the head of him that was separate from his brothers. Unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. That word everlasting in Hebrew is, doesn't mean everlasting like from this point forward. It means everlasting. They've been here for a long, long time. It, uh, a good English word is primordial. A good English word is the hills that have been here forever and ever. And, and uh, then we have a first clue of where the oil might be. Jacob says, they shall be on the blessings. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. So now we have some, just some vague hints in Jacob's blessing. When he's blessing his 12 sons before he dies, we've got that Jacob says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you in the last days. So we have an idea of when. He's got, he says, Asher's bread shall be fat. Let's just shelve that one for a minute. It's just too vague for us. But he says Jacob is going to have... Uh, his blessings are going to be like a well. He says Jacob's going to have the blessings of the deep that lieth under and the blessings of the everlasting hills. And he says that that blessing will be on the crown of the head of Joseph. So let's, let's fast forward now. This was in Egypt. This is 12 sons, 12 boys. There we go, 12 boys. Let's fast forward 430 years. The Israelites in Canaan fall out of favor with the Pharaoh. We think it was a, we think it was a Hyksos Pharaoh that, uh, that blessed Joseph like this. And when, when the Hyksos fell out of power, the Israelites fell out of favor, and they went into slavery for 400 years. Moses, as you know, uh, God called to deliver from slavery, and, and he delivers the, the Israelites to the promised land. The, the Israelites wander the desert for 40 years, and now they're coming into the promised land. Let's go to Deuteronomy, and we'll start in 32. This has happened now. Now, the 12 sons in this time, in this 430 years, the 12 sons have turned into 12 tribes. They've turned into 2 million people. So now we have a nation of 2 million people getting ready to enter into this promised land. The, the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons were never fulfilled in those 430 years. The blessings were made for a later date, and we'll see how late that date really is. But now the Israelites, two million strong, have wandered the Holy Land, or have wandered the desert for 40 years. They're just about to enter into the Promised Land. And Moses addresses this group of two million people. And he begins in chapter 32 with his, with his he's called the Song of Moses. And it's, it's kind of like, it's Moses' last words. He can't go into the promised land, remember. He has to stay out. But it's his last words to the people of Israel. And 32.8 begins with something just fascinating. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam and set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when God divided, when he, in, the, in the beginning, in creation, God knew where the nations would reside. He divided their inheritance by the land, and he divided it according to the children of Israel. It's, it's fascinating to see here that God understands the national boundaries, that God understands the boundaries of the people, and that he considered Israel, he considered Jacob in that dividing of the boundaries. Let's go down to, um, he, 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 talks about, he talks about Jacob and, uh, in, in 10, 11, and 12. He found him in the desert land and in the waste howling wilderness, he led, him, he, he led him about, he instructed him and kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her young, her, I'm sorry, stirreth up her, her nest, 
fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on, on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him there, and was no strange God with him. This is talking about Jacob. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Again, it's, we, can, we can take that as a, as a generality, as saying, well, he's just saying that you know, he'll provide plenty of olive oil and plenty of honey, and he'll, he'll provide everything Jacob needs. But the words that Moses uses here, the words that God gave him, he will suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. That word suck is the Hebrew word for suckle. If you looked at modern Hebrew today, it would, the root for pump would be that Hebrew word for suckle. There was no other word back then to describe that. There was no other concept to describe that. He made him suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. So now is our first mention of oil. In, uh, in 33, Moses begins again with Jacob's blessing. Again, these are two million people. Jacob gave his blessing to the 12 sons. What Moses does here in 33 is he repeats Jacob's blessings to the 12 tribes, and he expands on those blessings. And of the tribes, of some of the tribes, he said in verse 12, and of Benjamin, he said, beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. It's a bit cryptic. The Lord shall cover him all day long. That means the Lord's power could cover him, the Lord's safety could cover him. But he says, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. It doesn't mean Benjamin, the tribe, will dwell between God's shoulders. It's, it's too far-fetched to mean that. What Moses is doing here is he's giving the blessings of the land to the tribes of Israel. So when this verse talks about Benjamin's land dwelling, dwelling between his shoulders, and we've got to ask, whose shoulders are we talking about? The very next verse begins with Joseph's blessing. All of Joseph... And of Joseph, he said, blessed of the Lord be his land. Again, it's the land that we're talking about here. For the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that couches beneath. There's again that mention that, that Jacob had back in Genesis of the blessings of the deep that coucheth beneath. Um, a friend of ours, uh, Dr. Roger Luther up in Michigan, uh, told us that that word coucheth actually means something under pressure, something, something ready to spring up under pressure. And it's fascinating that he would use these words about this blessing of the deep that croucheth under, that there's something deep that is under pressure waiting to spring up. The, it, it's amaz the, word, the words the Lord uses in this through Moses, they're there for a reason. They point to something. And I really, really know that this is pointing to, to this, to this uh, blessing that we're talking about deep beneath. <coughs> And again, in 15, uh, Moses says, uh, still of, of, of Joseph, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains and for the precious things of the lasting hills. There's those primordial hills again. And for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Again, there's the head of Joseph and the top of head, his head mentioned. That's where the blessings are going to reside. In Benjamin, remember, Benjamin will dwell between his shoulders. I really believe that he's talking about Benjamin's land, and I really believe that when he says his shoulders, he's referencing Joseph, Joseph here. So whatever that means, however cryptic that it means, is he's talking about Benjamin will reside between Joseph's shoulders. We don't know what that means exactly yet, but, but I really believe that that. Joseph being right after Benjamin. It's a reference to Joseph. <clears throat> so now we've got, again, this repeat of the blessings of the deep that lie beneath, the blessings of the primordial hills, the blessings of the ancient mountains, and we've got this mention that these blessings are going to be on the top of the head of Joseph. So we're getting a clue here that the Bible may be talking about oil, and it may be telling us, maybe giving us a hint 
as to where this oil might be. He goes, he goes on blessing the other tribes. Um, here's a fascinating one, uh, verse 18. He blesses Zebulun and Issachar together. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountains. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. For they shall suck, that's that word again, it's Yannick, it's that, su- that word suckle, that root word that the, the, the modern Israeli term pump comes from. That's that same root word again. For they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. We're getting a lot more obvious here, folks. How, how, far, how far can we go to try to make this into something else? Suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. In, in 4,000 year ago terms, what could this have meant? Who, I'm, I'm sure Moses had no idea what it meant, and Zebulun and Issachar were probably, were probably wondering what it meant. Zebulun and Issachar will suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. The next verse, and of Gad, he said, blessed be he that enlargeth Gad, he dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. It has nothing to do with oil. It has nothing to do with... All, all, all we see here is that a possibility. We have Joseph's head. We have the crown of Joseph's head. We have Joseph's head. We have this idea that Benjamin is going to dwell between his shoulders. And here we have this mention of Gad that blessed is he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. That's a, a strange verse really strange verse. What could it possibly mean, teareth the arm with the crown of the head? It, it's got nothing to do with oil, but we'll keep it because we've got a head, we've got shoulders, and now we say we've got uh, an arm. They teareth the arm with the crown of the head. Let's just keep that. Nothing to do with oil, but we're starting to see these body parts line up. We're starting to see a head, we're starting to see a crown of a head, we're starting to see shoulders, and now we have this arm that teareth at the head. Let's go on to a a really exciting verse that, that when we talk about oil in Israel, most people understand and they get right away. Um, in Deuteronomy 33, 24, uh, Moses uh, gives Asher his blessing, gives the tribe of Asher their blessing. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Let him dip his foot in oil. Now we've got something. We've got a foot that goes along with the head and the shoulders and the arm. We've got dipping his foot in oil. Now, that can be a, a euphemism for, you know, bathing his feet in olive oil. A lot of folks think that. It could be a, an idea that, hey, he's going to be so rich that he can afford to have olive oil pedicures. But that's not what the Bible says. He says, let him dip his foot in oil. This is all reference. Remember, this is reference to the land and to the tribes. Then we have verse 25, still talking about Asher. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Asher's going to dip his foot in oil, and his shoes are going to be of iron and brass. Again, amazing that Moses would prophesy this 4,000 years ago. What could that possibly mean, iron and brass? And, and different theologians have tried to figure it out and come up with excuses, but frankly, um, they're they're trying to construct. They're, they're, they're doing their very best to try to say, this can't be about oil, but it, it's just obvious in the Bible. Once we see all this, it's obvious in the Bible what that is. So what we've got so far, just to recap, we've got ble- Jacob's blessing. Well, first of all, we've got the Lord that knows the beginning from the ending, and he knows what Israel's going to be going through in the last days, just like he prepared for them in the first days. We know that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the land as an everlasting possession. We know that when Jacob gave his blessings, he promised his son Joseph that the blessings would be on the crown of the head of Joseph. And we know that Jacob promised the blessings of the deep that lieth beneath and the blessings of the ancient mountains. We know that Moses repeated that same blessing. We know that Benjamin land, for whatever this means, is going to dwell between his shoulders. And whose shoulders right now we're assuming he's talking about Joseph. We know that Joseph, again, it's repeated about his blessing being deep and crouching beneath, under pressure. 
We know that that's going to be in the ancient mountains. We know that Zebulun and Issachar, doesn't mention anything about body parts with Zebulun and Issachar, but we know that Zebulun and Issachar will suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. And we know for whatever strange reason, whoever enlarges Gad is going to be blessed. And whoever enlarges Gad is going to tear the arm with the crown of the head. Whatever that means, that's what we know. And we know that Asher is going to dip his foot in oil and his shoes are going to be made out of iron and brass. This was all, this was all written a long, long time ago, folks. This was, this was here before the first oil well was ever drilled. This was here before man even imagined what petroleum would do to this world. Okay, brother. Um, now let's look at... Let's look at the map of the tribes of Israel. I'll show you how amazing God is. To show you, to, this, this will blow your mind. In, in reference to those promises, what we see today, this will blow your mind. <clears throat> I'll get out my pointer. It's about like my microphone. Um, this is a map of the uh, inheritance of the tribes of Israel. Uh, this is when, the, when Israel came in and conquered the land. This was how the... Uh, the tribes were divided geographically. Manasseh and Ephraim, what you don't see here is you don't see a tribe called Joseph. Back just before Jacob gave his blessings to the entire family, he called Joseph aside privately. And he said, bring your sons in here. Joseph had two sons in Egypt while he was in Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob, probably because he knew Joseph was blessed, probably because the Lord led him, probably because Joseph saved his family from famine in Egypt. Took the two boys, blessed the two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were half Egyptian, half Israelite, blessed them, and by blessing them, he, he also adopted them. He said, you'll be like my sons now. So, so in reference to the inheritance I'm about to give my boys, you will be like my sons. So when the Israelites came into the Holy Land, we don't see the tribe of Joseph. What we see here is the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim, and those are the tribes that represent Joseph. <clears throat> Manasseh is right here in northern Israel. This is, the, uh, this is Haifa up here. This is the Kaishan River Valley. It's also the Carmel Rift. It's a very important geologic area. There's Ephraim right there. The blessing is on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brothers. Can you see, can you begin to see a crown of a head? Can you begin to see a head? Oops. Can you see a nose and a mouth and a chin? Jordan River, the Kaishan River Valley, the Carmel Fault, up to Haifa, the Mediterranean coast. The blessing was on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head who was separated from his brethren. Isn't that amazing that a promise could turn into a geographical territory? Remember what, what Moses said in Deuteronomy 32? When the Lord set the boundaries of the nations. The Lord did this. The Lord, the Lord knew where those boundaries would be a long time ago. Of Zebulun and Issachar, there's nothing, it doesn't say anything about, the Bible doesn't say anything about, and there will be another section of land on top of Joseph's crown. But it does say, Zebulun and Issachar will suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. Isn't it fascinating that the blessing is on the crown of the head of Joseph. And both Zebulun and Issachar's land boundaries the crown of the head of Joseph. Zebulun and Issachar couldn't have been down here by the Dead Sea. They couldn't have been over here where Gad is. They couldn't have been anywhere else to, to partake of that blessing. They had to be on the crown of the head of Joseph. Remember Benjamin? He will dwell safely between his shoulders. Benjamin couldn't have been anywhere else. Here's Joseph's head. Here's his chin. Here's his neck. Here's his shoulders. 
Benjamin, in order for this prophecy to be true, in order for us to test out this prophecy, Benjamin couldn't have been anywhere else. He couldn't have been down here. He couldn't have been up here. Benjamin dwells between his shoulders. Here's the weird one. Gad is the arm torn. Manasseh was too big of a tribe. They had too many people. They were forced to go over the Jordan River. They were forced to, to push into Gad's land, and they were forced to tear Gad's land out in order to, to settle East Manasseh. Blessed is he who tears the arm of the head. That was Manasseh, and we'll see that Manasseh is blessed. But isn't it fascinating, again, that God would do that? And here's the exciting one. Here's the one everybody gets. Asher. Asher shall dip his foot in oil. Of course, on the crown of the head of Joseph. The blessings on the crown of the head of Joseph. Zebulun and Issachar will suck of the abundance of the seas because they border the crown of the head of Joseph. Asher will dip his foot in oil. Oh, um, Asher's shoes, made of iron and brass. This is oil country. You know what rigs are made out of? Iron and brass, so they don't spark. God knew that 4,000 years ago, too. This is, um, John's going to come up here after me and talk about uh, what's done about that. John's, uh, just one thing real quick I'm going to say about maps. <clears throat> you look in the back of your Bible, and there's going to be a map of the 12 tribes of Israel. And depending on who made the map, depending on what time of history they made the map, depending on what archaeologist or geologist they followed in their notes to make the map, maps change, especially of ancient lands. They go back and forth and back and forth and change borders. But every single map that's been made of the 12 tribes of Israel has Ephraim and Manasseh here, bordering the Kishon River Valley. They have Zebulun and Issachar here. They have Asher here. They have Benjamin here. They have Gad here. Every single map, every single interpretation has this. God's not, God's not dependent on map makers, but the map makers, no matter what their interpretation, they come up with the same story. You see John's map, this is, this is John's map, Zion Oil and Gas. John's map has Asher a little bit different. He's got him, his foot kind of turned around. You remember in the later days of Israel, um, that you might, not, you might not know this, but Phoenicia up here on the top, Tyre and Sidon were never conquered early on when, when Joshua came in on the conquest of, of Canaan. They were never conquered. So. So Tyre and Sidon existed up here in this white area. They were never conquered. Uh, eventually, the Israelites came in and conquered them, and Asher took over that land. Okay, one of the things through the years John and I have talked about is you see how this map has that foot with the toe kind of kind of pointing up like that. And John says, I like this map a lot better because you can see the toe going down. <laughs> and we've had this, John had this discussion with my father several years ago. And John says, you need to change your map, Jim. <laughs> and Dad says, I'm not changing my map. <laughs> so that bothered me, and I did a little bit of research into it. And what happened is there, there, was a, there was a border dispute between Manasseh and Asher. And during that time, that, that toe of that foot continually kept dipping down into Manasseh's territory. And isn't it, isn't it great, John, that the Bible says Asher shall dip his toe in oil and, or dip his foot in oil, and not only does he dip his foot in oil if, if the borders stayed the same, all he's doing, the whole history of Israel, he kept dipping his foot into oil. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's fascinating to me, and John will talk a little bit about what this territory means. John heard my father speak about this in 1981. And John had no, I don't think he knew how to change the oil in his car. So he, he really didn't know much about oil. But he knew how to drink it, yeah. <laughs> but, but he knew that God's word was true. And he knew that, that if this was true, then somebody had to go get that. 
And he'll talk about that in a while. But this is the territory. This is the exploration territory. Zion oil and gas is exploration territory. On the crown of the head of Joseph, in the land of Asher, in the land of Zebulun and Issachar. So today, this, is, this prophecy right now, right now today, is being fulfilled. And that's the fascinating thing to me. That's the wonderful thing that we can read God's promises from 3,700 years ago and see those promises fulfilled today. Um, what does that mean for us today? What does that mean for the nation of Israel today? Uh, Brother Al called me earlier and said, asked if I'd be uh, speaking about Ezekiel at all. And Ezekiel is a good reference. Ezekiel says a couple of things about Israel. <clears throat> Ezekiel said that in the last days, those dry bones will come together again. And the, and the uh, devastation, and the devastated cities will be rebuilt. And Ezekiel says that in the last days, Israel will be better off than she was in her former days. In the last days, she'll be greater than she was. Richer, more powerful, she will in every way be better than she was in the, in the previous days. Ezekiel also prophesies about an entity or some entities called Gog and Magog. And Ezekiel prophesies that God will put an evil thought into the mind of Gog and Magog. And they will come down into Israel to take a spoil. We believe that Gog and Magog represent the, the, uh, the Russian states and their allies. And everybody's, people pretty much accepted that as fact for a long time. What they could never figure out is what in the world does Israel have that would be worth taking a spoil? They, there, there isn't anything. If you discount strawberries and pomegranates and bananas, there's not a lot in Israel for, for Russia to come take a spoil of. <clears throat> um, that 85 million barrels a day I talked about, um, we've gone up from that. We, we use more than 85 million barrels a day now. What a lot of folks don't know is Russian and the former Soviet states pump oil as fast or faster than anyone. Back in, this is 2005, my, uh, my research back in 2005 said that if Russia keeps pumping the way they're pumping, they will completely um, devastate their, their known reserves in the year 2021. Russia hasn't kept to that pace. They've increased that pace. There will come a day when Russia runs out of oil. Russia's pumping faster than they've ever pumped before, and they only have so many known reserves. <clears throat> How many folks here have heard about the natural gas discovery off the coast of Haifa? This, this prophecy is being fulfilled right now. It, the, the discover, oil's already been discovered. Natural gas has already been discovered. The discovery off the coast of Haifa, right here, every time they come back, first they came back and they said, this is enough for Israel for 15 years. Then they had to come back and revive it, revise it to say, there's a lot more here than we ever imagined. Then they had to come back and revise it to say, we think maybe there's enough for Israel for 50 years. Then they had to come back and revise it and say, Honestly, folks, we have no idea how much is here, but there's a lot. And every time we go back, there's more. Chuck Davidson is the CEO of a Noble Oil Company out of Houston. They're the ones with the offshore rigs here in the, in the Haifa discovery. <clears throat> Chuck Davidson let it slip to the, to the uh, media about a month ago. He said, he, he kind of said it backwards. He says, he said, I've never promised anybody that there's oil underneath the natural gas reserves. All we know is it's, it's pretty good possibility there is. Chuck Davidson let it slip that internally his folks are saying, you know, we got more gas here than we know what to do with. Not only is Israel going to be completely supplied with natural gas, which runs their electricity, which runs their industry, which runs a lot of other things, not only are they going to be completely supplied with natural gas, they're going to be exporting this stuff. There's just too much stuff here. And then they're saying, you know what, guys, if the model's right, by the time we get through this natural gas thing, I think we may have oil underneath this natural gas. It's amazing. What you don't know is Gazprom, the Russian oil giant, has had in the workings a lot for a long, long, long time a gas pipeline that would come down through the Mediterranean and supply the Mediterranean states 
um, Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, supply the Mediterranean states with natural gas. Russia's goal, Russia's stated goal, was to control the energy production and, and supply to the, med to the Mediterranean states. That was their goal. Their political goal is to control the geopolitical status of the Mediterranean states. They want to be, they see, <clears throat> they always see the U.S. as a, as a uh, competitor. And the U.S. has been the country that is, has stabilized the Middle East as far as Israel and the other, as the other countries. Russia wants to come in as that, as that referee and, and exert their power and be the, be the country that brings peace to the Middle East. <clears throat> so economically, they want to control the energy in the Middle East. Politically, they want to control the political situation in the Middle East. When they found out about noble oil drilling for a gas off the, off the coast, Gazprom came in and said, okay, we want to be a part of this. We're very interested in the Mediterranean states. We want to be a part of this. Let's see if we can make a deal. There was no discovery. There was just some exploration. The deal fell through. So Gazprom said, fine, the deal fell through. We'll continue on with the pipeline. Right after the deal fell through, Noble makes its discovery. So now Russia's in this position where they didn't get in on the discovery, and now the pipeline's worthless. The pipeline idea is dead. There's, there's no need for a pipeline. That you, you, shouldn't, you can't bump natural gas from the Russian states to a place that already has more natural gas than they know what they can do with. So now Russia's gone back to the table to think, okay, now, now what do we do? What, what kind of position are we in with our plans to dominate the Middle East um, with energy and denominate it, dominate it geopolitically? What do we can do? So at this point, it's just conjecture about the hook in the jaw of Gog. It's just conjecture about the evil thought that God's going to put into the mind of, of, of Gog and Magog. But at this point, we, at least we have something to go on. At this point, we're not talking about strawberries and pomegranates. We're talking about a, a real reason for Russia to come down into Israel. But we also know from Ezekiel that that was a very bad idea for Russia, that, that, that she's decimated, that the Lord decimates her. And we also know from, from Ezekiel that the whole reason for this, the whole reason, people think of the Gog-Magog war as a terrible thing. And they're looking at that bleakness, that, 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 that idea of Israel getting invaded by this massive army. God brings victory. God destroys those armies. And in doing that, Ezekiel says he does two things. He shows the nations his power and his majesty unequivocally so they know that God did this. And he shows Israel unequivocally who saved him. So that's, that's the plan behind that Gog and Magog war. For me personally, it's, it's <clears throat> really comforting to know that God knew back then about what's happening today and that he prepared for it. Because that way I know that God knows what's happening for me right now and that he knows what's going to happen for me tomorrow. Yeah. So personally, that's very, very comforting for me. So I can put my faith in him the same way Abraham put his faith in him for 4,000 years ago. Yeah. That, that's what we have. That's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to know that God had well in hand. If you worry about the last days, don't worry about the last days. <laughs> God knew that back then. He, he planned it this way. Don't, don't worry about the last days. God will take care of the last days. You just worry about what he tells you to do. But uh, that's, that's the prophecy of oil in Israel. And the last question is, so if you know all this, what are you going to do about it? And that was, after John Brown heard that in 1981, the first question he had was, well, if that's true, how come nobody's done anything about it? So I'll, I'll leave you with that. And um, um, after the break, brother, we'll play that little video and, and then give it to John. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you.